I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about morphing buttons, range sliders, declarative animation, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have a library called Pull and Zoom. The Pull and Zoom library replicates the functionality that you might have seen in the Twitter application on iOS. So what happens is, as you're scrolling down the page, a background image will zoom in. This is what it looks like on Android. So if you scroll down, it will actually get bigger and appear to zoom in on the image. Wow. Now, this also works on iOS. Uh, this is a very, very simple plugin. You just initialize pull and zoom after adding the load event listener to your site, and you give it the main page, which is going to be the main element, and the background image, and then call this ping method. After that, it is completely done. Um, so it's really a very, very small plugin. There's actually not a lot of code here. If you look at pullandzoom.js, it really just initializes the options and then adds event listeners for touch move, scroll, um, touch start and end, and then it uses WebKit transforms and transitions to perform that background pull and zoom. So um, that's it, pretty simple plugin, but pretty nice, you know, pretty easy to use. Go ahead and integrate that on your pages if you want to. We're not going to force you. You don't have to do anything we say. Yeah, it's, I, I wouldn't listen to anything we say. No. Well, next up is a really cool demo on the CodeDrops blog called Morphing Buttons. It's a morphing buttons concept, and they have a bunch of different types here. Here are the login and sign up buttons. Let's click these and see what they do. Whoa, what just happened? What? A modal window wow. came up, and it was transformed from this button. They have terms of service here, so you can click that, and it brings it up. That's uh, definitely a TLDR there. Yeah. You can subscribe, so you could subscribe to our newsletter, and it folds out this form. That's pretty amazing. I really like this share one. When you click share this, watch this. Whoa, what, what just happened? happened. The and future then, of UI is now. And then they have this really amazing video player. You just click watch the trailer, and it brings up a movie trailer. So this is pretty amazing. If we head over to the Code Drops article, we can scroll down the page, and you can either view this demo, or you can download the source. And alternatively, you can find this project on GitHub. So all the code to do this is right here, and you can jump into the CSS and see exactly how all of this is being done. We're not going to get into the code, but I did want to show you this really cool design concept. I think it's a pretty smart way to show small bits of content like terms and conditions or like a contact form or you know, the share buttons like that. Well, it also adds just a little bit of context to what you're doing. You it know, does. In case you forget what button you just clicked. Which happens to me all the time. Yeah, I know. I, I can't be trusted to surf the web and not click on things. Mm -mm. All right, next up, we have a project called rangeslider.js. This is a really, really simple um, jQuery and JavaScript polyfill for the HTML5 range slider element. So here is an example of the range slider right here. And you can see as I drag the cursor, it will update the value. Um, what's really nice about this is it's touchscreen friendly, and it recalculates on resize, so you can use it with your responsive designs. And it's, uh, it's very, very easy to use. Um, it's compatible with standard HTML input elements, supports IE8 and up. And I mean, look at that. All you do, you grab an element and call the range slider method on it. If you want to delete it, call destroy. Now, it does have a few different options. You can either use it as a polyfill, um, call the different classes that you want to use, range slider, range slider fill, and handle. And then you get callbacks for initialize, slide starting, and sliding ending. So cool, they have a few different examples right here. Here's a, an example of destroying it and falling back to the native element or initializing it. And there you go. Again, very, very simple. You can find the link to this in our show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse, or search for us on iTunes. We are The Treehouse Show. Very nice stuff. Well, next up is WTF Forms. Uh, I'm saying it like that because there's a question mark. 
there. Hmm. This is a restyling of several common form controls it's done by Mark Otto. You may know him from Twitter formerly. He is now at GitHub, and he works on the Bootstrap project. And these form controls are designed for Chrome, Safari, Firefox, and Internet Explorer 9 and up. So let's take a look at them. Here are some checkboxes. So we have these custom checkbox styles. There's some nice radio buttons here. I like that. And you can also restyle what icons you're using for each one of these. So that's pretty cool. There's also a select menu here. So pretty standard stuff there. And there's a file browser, which is actually notoriously difficult to restyle. I've tried to do that in years past, and it was difficult. Maybe it's easier now, and it's especially easier with WTF forms. There's a good FAQ here, and one thing in particular I'd like to highlight is that it doesn't style every form control just yet, and there's no four attributes, but that's perfectly fine because if you look at the markup here, all of the form uh, elements are wrapped in label elements. So if you click on the form elements, uh, they'll, they'll be selected because they're wrapped in labels. Uh, so right now it doesn't require JavaScript, so that's pretty nice. It just requires uh, CSS, so that's great. And will this be added to Bootstrap? Possibly, but not until version 4.0 at the earliest. So you heard it here, folks. This is, uh, this is the beginning of Bootstrap 4. This is so, the beginning of the future. That's right. The future will be later, but right now we can start on it. And it's only maybe, so. Perfect. Great. Next up, we have a project called Quill. Quill is a, a very nice, rich text editor built for the modern web. So you can have a text editor right here, and then you can do some typing. Look at me. I'm typing. And you can make things bold, italic, underline, and add images and links. And it is a what you see is what you get editor. Now, what's really nice about this, though, is that you have access to events inside of the JavaScript object. So you can get access to the text changing, and then you can even see where it came from, and you get access to the delta, which is going to be what changed inside of the text field. And you can also get access to what was selected inside of that particular editor. And that will allow you to do different things if you want to. So uh, pretty cool. You know, you can add toolbar buttons and customize the toolbar if you want to. And as we're looking at this, the markup is relatively minimal and actually kind of semantic at the same time. So it also supports uh, different themes. There aren't too many out there right now, but they're saying it's because the interface has not been finalized just yet. Anyway, this is a really nice project. And if you do need to add a rich text editor to your site, definitely give it a look. See what you think. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is rendering realistic terrain in 130 lines. This is pretty impressive. Uh, actually, I'd like to start out with the demo. So explore otherworldly terrain. We can click on that, and it's going to render this kind of interesting looking terrain. And if I refresh the page a couple different times, it will generate different terrain, and there's even some water there. That's pretty amazing. And this is all being done, like I said, in 130 lines of JavaScript, which is fairly compact. So how is this being done? Well, first, a height map is being generated. And if you're not familiar with 3D graphics, a height map is a two-dimensional array. So it's sort of the data structure that you're looking at. And then you take that data, and you can extrude the terrain from the two-dimensional map. So you basically map how, how tall each part of the terrain should be. And traditionally in 3D graphics, a dark portion will be low and the light portion will be higher. So they generate this height map. And then they can have a couple of different ways of rendering it. So you could render it as just a flat height map. You could do it in an isometric perspective, or you could do it in perspective. And there's all that there. Now, you also have to light it. So they show how they do lighting and shadowing. And then, like I said, they do the perspective projection right there. Now, obviously, this is pretty complicated code. 
But if you're interested in generating procedural terrains or you know, doing some advanced algorithm design in JavaScript, this is a really cool example of uh, really great code that does one thing and does it really, really well. I'm not sure when specifically you might need to use something like this on a website, but it's just good code to kind of help you practice your skills. Yeah, it's really cool. Next up, we have a project called AnnieJS. This is a declarative library for CSS animations. So let's take a look at the example right here. So click Square Demo. Get, get a load of this. Watch this page. It goes crazy. Wow. What? What's going on? What is going on? Look at this. I go to input my name. Everything just falls out of place. What? Where's it going? Why, why is it going there? So you might think that a ton of code is required to get this to work, but no, this is all being handled in a data attribute. So you give it data any JS, and we're saying if this gets focused, do a wobble and then give it a target. So there are a few different animations that you can do, um, and the if is also supported. If we look at the documentation, you can see here, there we go, wiki pages, sentence definition. So the different if scenarios are pretty easy to understand. You know, if we click on something, if we focus something or scroll to it, or content has been loaded, and then we do it on what part of the page, header, footer, whatever. You know, so here we're saying, hey, if we're clicking on the header, or on the footer, then swing everything. Not really sure you would want, why you want to do a swing, but hey, you might want to. Um, and then it tells you two, and that is the element that is going to be animated. Now, um, if it's not specified, then the element that was declared on is what event will be triggered on and animated. So this is a pretty interesting library. I don't know if I'm completely sold on animating based on sentences, but it is very, very simple to use if you just want to get started with uh, some simple animations. So definitely make sure to check it out, evaluate it, see if it's right for you and your project. You know, it's nice that it does use CSS animations as well. So, Very cool stuff. Well, next up is a wonderful blog post about Bezier curves and how they relate to type design. Now, if you are designing a font, which is a fairly ambitious endeavor, if you've never done it before, it's actually pretty complicated then this is a really great blog post about how to design all of your curves for the typeface. Now, we're not really highlighting this because we want you all to be really great type designers. This is actually an excellent tutorial on how Bezier curves work. Now, there's two different types of Bezier curves. One is a quadratic curve and one is a cubic curve. And they work with different types of typefaces best. However, the article suggests using cubic Bezier curves because you have fewer points overall, and there's a couple of other different reasons. But the thing I want to highlight here is this really amazing animated GIF. Actually, it's right here. Excuse me, GIF. Thank you. And basically, when a cubic curve is being drawn, you have a quadratic curve. That was a quadratic curve curve, and here is a cubic curve, and it's being drawn by rendering this quadratic curve between the two cubes. And when a curve is being drawn like this, it's actually a bunch of tiny little planes. It's not actually a curve because it has to be rasterized to the screen. When you say a bunch of tiny little planes, you don't mean like, like passenger airplanes, right? No, and I don't mean tiny little airplanes either. Okay. Yeah. No, it's just a, it's just a normal uh, plane. Um, in the computer, and it's basically just rendering a bunch of tiny little straight lines, you could say, to create this curve. Anyway, it's a great explanation of how Bezier curves work, and you should definitely check out this post, even if you're not a type designer. I am not a type designer, and I will check out that post, Nick, because you recommended it. Very nice. Who are you on Twitter? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything we talked about, you can get to our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. You can also search for us on iTunes. We are The Treehouse Show. Don't forget to rate us. Also, if you'd like to get one month free of Treehouse, make sure to click the link that we have in the show notes. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile, business, and so much more, 
be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com and use that link to get a free month. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week.